I'm, I'm just going to keep the waiting room open now so as people kind of flood in. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you guys so much for attending today's session. Um, like I said, what we were saying, we kind of got the, the gang back together again. Um, this is uh, getting some of the OGs of the webinar series back together. But luckily, this is not about um, COVID. Uh, this time, thank God. Um, so this is uh, based on some recent um, legislative updates um, that came out of this most recent legislative uh, uh, um, session uh, here in the state of Kentucky. So we felt like this is pretty pertinent uh, for you as employers um, to, to know kind of the ins and outs about some of these um, changing drug laws in Kentucky, especially, especially as it pertains to um, medical marijuana. Um, and hopefully this gives you enough time and enough to consider to kind of get your action plan together as you prepare for the, the upcoming changes. So thank you so much for joining us again. Um, sorry, I'm looking at the, at the um, chat, but we got, you guys got that? I see. All right. So um, we got 60 minutes on the book today. We have uh, two different speakers that are going to give you guys some of their expertise and best practice. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to talk about, obviously about some marijuana laws and employment, both national and Kentucky um, um, considerations. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between medical and recreational use and some specific in, um, areas around medical marijuana or marijuana and accommodating under disability laws. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about best practice around creating policies and screening and criteria um, for you as an employer. Um, and then obviously we'll end with Q&A, our favorite part. Um, and Jim has already put in the, um, <laughs> in the chat uh, that uh, he, we, you know, we can answer general questions, um, but not specifics um, with specific circumstances because um, it may constitute legal advice. But uh, we do welcome the question and the Q&A. Also, um, you know, we will be um, looking at the, the chat. So we'd love to answer your questions. We try to do that towards the end though. Um, so you please submit your questions via the Zoom chat. Um, this session is going to be is being recorded currently. Um, we will always send out the email with the recordings uh, uh, shortly after. Um, but if you ever need the materials going forward, we post all of our slide decks and videos on our website, on the HRG website under our webinar tab and also on our YouTube channel. Um, and you will also receive SHRM credits via email after the event if you need to submit those. All right, so housekeeping, I think we're good to go. Like I said, we have kind of gotten the old gang back together again. So if some of these people are very, probably very familiar to this group, but if you're new and you haven't, you didn't turn in during our COVID webinar series, we have James Morris with us, Jim Morris uh, from Morris & Morris, um, our attorney extraordinaire um, and his expertise on this. And then we have Allison Petri, our director of HR outsourcing. So we are very happy to have them both be able to speak to these, um, these issues or this issue. Um, so Jim, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you and just let me know when you want me to move forward on your slides, okay? Okay, so. All right. Uh, if everybody can hear me okay, I'll get started. So with regard to the, the marijuana laws and uh, issues, I don't know if anybody was on uh, when we did this, but we actually did a presentation about the issues that you have as a Kentucky employer uh, with regard to marijuana laws. Uh, and that was a couple of years ago based upon the status of uh, the law as it stood then. Obviously, we have a tremendous change now. So I've put together some legal information for you and I've tweaked the information if you want to go back and look either on our website or on the, the HRG website to see what we talked about before. Last time it was more about dealing with a national and how to handle border issues, um, drug testing, uh, employment screening, uh, EAP, other issues. This time we're focused more on, okay, we've changed our law. What does it mean? So let's go to the next. So let's start with the obvious, which is marijuana is illegal. Uh, cannabis is 100% illegal uh, in the United States of America, unless you are part of an FDA approved internal um, activity, you cannot use marijuana you cannot allow marijuana use. It is illegal under federal law. However, and that's a, I've got it up there, the Controlled Substance Act of 1970, 
It is illegal in any form for any purpose. And it's imp interesting because it also says it's a schedule one substance. It has high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. It's ironic because then the uh, FDA has come out with THC derivative products, CBD, other things that have actually been approved, even though it's still a schedule one drug that has no medical um, uh, use whatsoever. So here's the issue. The reason why I start with federal is it's illegal. Start with that. Your state is allowing it under limited circumstances. If you engage in federal activities, like you have a contract for federal at all, you have to make sure that you're in compliance with your federal. And some of those will require that you, uh, that you comply with the Drug-Free Workplace Act. So you have to make sure that you are complying with not only the state, but the federal, if you have any federal involvement. If you have federal involvement, but you have to also comply with state, you're gonna to have to carve out. If you want to have different policies, you'll have to carve out state versus federal and preclude people from working on federal based upon uh, minimum standard qualifications. And you'll need some legal guidance on that because that's gonna be a landmine. And I'll explain now why it is a landmine because state law, you can't do certain things. Federal law, you can't allow certain things and you're gonna be on both sides of that issue. Let's go to next. So what happened was this last session, the House and Senate passed Senate Bill 47. Senate Bill 47 was signed into law by the, uh, by the governor in Acts chapter 146, which means that 218A, which is our new chapter, hasn't been written yet because there are regulations, or I'm sorry, hasn't been enforced yet. There are regulations that have to be built there are issues that have to be addressed before a law can become a law. So what this basically provides is that the initial visit to a medical care provider uh, must be in person. The registration only lasts 60 days. You have to have a qualifying medical condition and I'll define that here in just a second. Smoking's not allowed, vaping will be. Uh, patients are not, will be allowed to possess a 30 day supply only. 10 day supply on their person at one time. So one's in your residence, one is on the person. You can't walk around with a vape product with a whole month's worth. You then would be able to be charged as a dealer instead of a medical user. Uh, you're not allowed to cultivate these in your home, which is different from several other states uh, because other states allow personal gross, per, personal growing uh, personal um, uh, manufacturing and distilling. Uh, Kentucky has gone the other way and says you must get it from a pre-approved and can't do it yourself. Let's go to next. So um, I'm gonna lose power here in a second. So give me a second. We had some technical difficulties this morning. I've lost internet uh, in my office. so. I just saw a notice I'm going to lose power. So I'm going to switch over and make sure I have power. What's a webinar without technical difficulties? I was going to say, what's, it's good what's to be a webinar back, with a little bit of a chip, with a little bit of a pause here? It looks like Jim had to leave the room and he's coming back in. So, Jim, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry all about right. that. There we go. Now you're fine. We're good. So, uh, all of a sudden, I saw the, the light go dim on my computer and I knew I was in trouble. I tried to hurry. So, um, qualifying medical condition is de defined in the statute. And what it's, uh, basically what it boils down to is cancer of any kind. Chronic, severe, intractable, or debilitating pain, epileptic type seizure disorder, multiple sclerosis, chronic nausea that's not treatable and it has a whole lot of other definitions in that, PTSD. And then here's the interesting one uh, because Kentucky has had a center for cannabis 
So any other uh, illness or any other mal, uh, mal malady, I think is what it's called, that is uh, identified by the Kentucky Center uh, for Cannabis Research that determines that this is something where medical uh, marijuana would benefit patient care. So those are the types of qualifying medical conditions. Let's go to the next. That basically lays out for you what, the, what we're dealing with, but then there are some other issues that we're gonna get into. I did include this just in case any of you, um, I did have a client involved in cannabis. So um, just in case you're on the cannabis side or you're looking at this from the side of, wow, can I open a new business? Yes, absolutely. There are uh, business controls set forth in chapter 218A. Those business um, uh, provi provisions include that there will not be a tax on the sale of medical marijuana. Uh, the flower has certain things that have to be uh, controlled. Edibles are controlled as to the size. If you don't know what an edible is, it's in a, it's not smoking or vaping, but it's in a edible format. Uh, they control those at 10 milligrams per serving. Uh, the regulations have to be adopted by July 1st, 2024. If you don't know how the law works in Kentucky, this is really critical on this issue because it will impact you as either an employer or as a producer or anyone else involved or impacted by uh, the medical marijuana bill. The way the law works is that there's a law put on the books, then the underpinning for the law has to be developed. They have to appoint a full board that will be the medical marijuana regulatory board. That board then has to fill in the gaps of the law. The law is like, you know, one, one section per statute, and it's like two or three paragraphs, kind of like what you see on the page here. Then you have to develop all of the regulations for enforcement of that law. Who's going to investigate? When do they investigate? How do they investigate? How many teams do we have? Who determines the cap of uh, THC? How is that determined? Where is that determined? Uh, is there a central repository? Uh, is there an, you know, is there due process appeals? Everything related to it. The other thing that's going to be in there for employers is you're going to have to deal with whatever regulations they put in place that say employers have to comply with privacy, disability, um, which doctor's notes are going to be accepted, which are not, uh, how you go about handling things. And this is going to dovetail with all the regulations and statutory control for anti-discrimination, workers' comp, and other statutes. So you're going to see a lot of things before July 1st, 2024. I got a lot of questions from my clients asking why is it waiting until January 1st, 2025? And my response was, I'm shocked it's not waiting until July 1st, 2025 or January 1st, 2026, because the easy work is done. Somebody adopted a statute based upon other state statutes, cleaned it up, got both houses to approve it, got the governor to sign it, that's the easy part. Now's the hard part because now all of the attorneys on Capitol Hill and all of the interested parties, businesses that want to grow marijuana, businesses that want to um, uh, want to know what to do when their employee says, I'm taking medical marijuana, that now has to be filled in. So that's where we are. All right, let's go to next. So how does this affect businesses? As I had indicated before, when we did this the last time, there were 19 states that adopted marijuana. Uh, in one form or another. There were uh, 33, I believe that, uh, I'm sorry, there were 33 that uh, um, had marijuana laws. Now there's 39. There are 23 that prohibit employers from discriminating right now. Only six protect an employee's right to use marijuana mar recreationally. Kentucky is not one of the states that allows recreational marijuana, period. So we're not dealing with, can you drug test somebody that had an accident and find out that they had marijuana in their system? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about medical marijuana and the disclosure of that to the employer. So the interesting thing is 218A or this bill that was passed does not impact the Civil Rights Act. So Kentucky did not change Chapter 344, which allows for no discrimination on the basis of 
race, age, gender, sexual orientation, disability, um, and smoking, and a couple of others. So um, in Kentucky and under the ADA, you can't engage in discrimination on the basis of not marijuana use. So, okay, can you discriminate? The answer is no, because this is a medical marijuana, which means there is a disability in place. If you go back to the conditions that we talked about, cancer, we talked about epileptic seizures, we talked about a variety of others, each one of those has been defined under the ADA and under federal law, under state law as being a disability, something that impacts the major life activity of the individual. So the problem you run into is no, we didn't change the statute. Yes, the statute still allows you to do drug testing, still allows you to, to go after people that are engaging in illegal activity, but you can't do it based on disability if the person is taking the drug and is allowed to under state law. So let's go to the next page. OSHA, um, OSHA adopted a rule, and I talked about this the last time. You can't retaliate against employees for work-related injuries, including drug testing. Um, that becomes an issue if you're going to try to do drug testing, so I put it in here. You need to look up the OSHA rule if you're planning on trying to drug test somebody that um, says, hey, you know, I, I think there's a problem here. And uh, they even acknowledge that they might've had drugs in their system. You have to be careful about that because OSHA passed that rule and you can't do that. The United States Supreme Court has said the drug testing in and of itself is not an illegal activity. It does not infringe upon the employee's reasonable, reasonable suspicion in order to protect the health, safety, and uh, welfare of others. So that is the, the law federally. Um, while, like I said just a minute ago, even though Kentucky didn't address it, we've got a problem on our hands. Let's go to the next page. Oh, and I'll say while you're switching page, you don't want to be, this is like when I talked about PPP, I talked about the unemployment benefits during COVID, I talked about several different aspects, and my comment to you was, please don't be the first employer that does something wrong because you're going to find out the hard way you're in front of one judge who's making a decision with no roadmap and it's going to be expensive even if you're in the right it's going to be expensive so some of this i'm giving you is practical guidance until there is a well-established case law roadmap you don't want to be the one plowing this new field of chapter 218a and find out the abc company uh, thought this was the right way to go and even had legal counsel thought this was the right way to go and they pushed the envelope too far and they ended up being the one that got sued because that's not how the regulations were interpreted or how one judge interpreted the law. So don't be the first. So chapter 344, 040, if you're not familiar with this, you need to get legal counsel because this is your anti-discrimination statute. I'm not going to read it all to you. I left out the part about... Uh, uh, smoking and all of the other protections that are available under Kentucky law. Basically, you cannot fail to fail or refuse to hire, discharge, or discriminate against any individual on the basis of inter alia their disability, or because they are a qualified individual with a disability, or because you believe that they are an individual with a disability, even if they don't have the underlying disability itself. So this is the statute that you have to comply with regardless of what 218 has to say. Let's go to the next page. Back up, yep. So pursuant to this, uh, a person with a disability is one who has a physical or mental impairment or one who is uh, considered or perceived to have one or one that has a history or a record of such an impairment. So anyone that comes to you with cancer or had cancer, anyone who has epileptic seizures or had epileptic seizures, or you believe they have epileptic seizures. They are all considered protected classified individuals under the state statute against discrimination on the basis of disability. If any of those individuals, anyone that, that qualifies under 218A for the, the life uh, activities and the major medical issues, they're all protected. That is a guarantee don't even try to go there. Person is protected under our state discrimination laws. So let's go to the next page. 
So with this, if you're looking at this, trying to look at the different laws, as I said, 218A would have been better if it had said, hey, by the way, or the, the bill would have been better if it said, hey, by the way, let's go ahead and add into our uh, anti-discrimination statute the ability to not discriminate against someone who's utilizing uh, medically prescribed medications, whatever you want to call them. You don't have to say cannabis. Uh, you can't engage in discrimination against someone who is legally utilizing medications prescribed under laws of the state of Kentucky. They didn't do that. So now you have a conflicting law. You, uh, and the first thing I got from people was, well, they didn't change the employment law, so we don't have to worry about it. And as I just said a minute ago, it's going to be a problem. You're going to have to be very careful. So, um, you know, what is, what's the tolerance level that you need to be looking at? Um, you can't adopt a zero tolerance of, of marijuana. Can't do it. You have to have qualifications in your handbooks. You have to have qualifications in your policies, your drug testing, your reasonable cause testing. Everything needs to be addressed. Um, your drug testing policies need to omit any reference to medical marijuana. If you were following my guidance before and pointed out that other states may have adopted it, but Kentucky was 100% on the other side and you can't use it, that needs to be removed. Uh, I would not use any internal drug testing results uh, because those now with this medical marijuana, you're going to run into issues because you're going to get false positives and issues related to uh, secondhand smoke and uh, tolerance levels and so on. Um, I would adopt a proper policy, make sure you have proper testing levels, and I would discuss your expectations with everyone in your employment right now. You can let them know it doesn't take effect until January 1st if you want. You can start to adopt this now, even though it's illegal in the state of Kentucky until January 1st, 2025, but it's time to start looking at your uh, drug testing policies, your handbooks. And the other thing I've learned is in looking at these, it's amazing to me how many of your businesses have a handbook that is not in compliance with your drug testing policy, that's not in compliance with your reasonable cause testing, that's not in compliance with whatever other policies you have, because they were written by different people at different times, and everybody thought this was a great policy, but if you look at them side by side, You've got conflicting instructions to your employees on this issue. You don't want to have a policy that exists that somebody has signed that says we have a zero tolerance because you're going to get sued for not addressing the fact that you're not going to discriminate on the basis of uh, someone taking medical marijuana pursuant to a properly prescribed prescription. So again, basically this last line on here, constantly in this this is outside of just the marijuana. This is everything. Read, reread, review, update, re-update, and constantly get guidance on your policies and procedures. Because I guarantee if you're not looking into what the current law is, you're not going to be up to date on those. And you're going to get burned one way or the other sooner or later. So next. There you go. You're on mute, Chase. Is that it? As I say, yeah, is that it for you, Jim? That's it for now. I'll look at the, right. chat, at the chat room. Sure, sure. Yeah, we'll cover some questions at the end. So thanks. Um, so yeah, so we'll transition over to Allison. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about more creation of policy and best practice around your pre-employment screening and reasonable suspicion creation policies. Um, so Allison, take it away. All right, hello. And my goal is to get through this fairly quickly so people have time for Q&A at the end. Um, but if you have any questions as I'm going along, feel free to put them in the chat. And then Jim, if um, you have any feedback on anything that I say, happy to um, hear from you as well, because I know a lot of the things that I'm going to say overlap with things that you have said. We're in agreement on a lot of places, but I'm sure that there's a couple of things in here that you may have some more opinions on, so feel free to um, chime in. But so in general, there are four main types of drug testing, pre-employment or pre-assignment, which as Jim kind of mentioned, doing pre-assignment or post-hire, but pre-placement um, drug testing is a pretty great thing. And then reasonable suspicion, um, random and post-accident. Those are all pretty self-explanatory. We're going to focus today on the pre-employment, pre-assignment, and reasonable suspicion pieces. Um, so Chase, you can move to the next. So three questions that 
um, as you are either creating or evaluating your existing drug testing policies are going to be, is it required? So as Jim said, if you're part of the Federal Drug Free Workplace Act, um, if you are a company that has a lot of federal contracts or have more guidelines or requirements, you may not be able to have a lot of leeway in your policy. Um, clearly, if you're part of the Department of Transportation and you have DOT drug testing requirements, there's not a lot of leeway. Certain industries and certain states have different requirements as well, so make sure you're looking at where your employees are. But like coal miners in West Virginia um, have some, some special requirements. And then, of course, if you're part of a union, um, drug testing is normally part of union negotiations. So your hands might be tied in those instances. But if you're part of a private sector company, you normally have a little more latitude in your policies. And so you'll then want to think about what is the goal I am trying to accomplish. We go into a lot of companies who have a drug testing policy and when we say, okay, what? Well, why do you have this? Because we have to, because it's always been this way, because this is what's always been done. So what we recommend people think about is what are you actually trying to do here? Are you trying to ensure the safety of your employees as they're working with equipment? Are you trying to protect, you know, if you're part of a bank, of course you want to be mindful of the type of people that are handling money, um, issues that they might have on the back end. You, But if you're working at an agency that's mostly creative, your goals might be a little bit different. So once you figured out what the goal is, so you don't just default to that it's always been done that way, then you want to think about how it fits with the company culture. So again, academic settings, a lot of times the culture is a little bit more um, lenient. Uh, creative cultures might be more lenient. Banking cultures, very buttoned up. Real estate, very buttoned up. So you want to make sure that, you know, you're not doing a, you're a hair test for a creative agency if your goal isn't to keep people safe. Um, Jim, it looks like you switched back on. Is that you have something to say? Or I do it, it fully in compliance with what you're saying, but something else that I want to make sure everybody understands, and we'll address some of this at the end too. You all need to be very careful in your pre-employment testing how you're going about asking because now you're dealing with HIPAA, disabilities. Who's going to ask your employee before you screen them do you have something to disclose before we test you? So you've got an issue on your hands where now, let's say that Allison's going to be the hiring authority and Allison wants to ask, wants to hire this person, but she gives them the drug test. Well, you are going to need to make sure that you're not excluding somebody for marijuana use if they're on a medical marijuana but now, Allison, if she's the one that did the drug test or received the results, may well have confidential information, ADA protected information, and you could be faced with a lawsuit because the hiring authority was the one that received the medical information and engaged in not hiring me after they got the fact that I was using medical marijuana. And I'm not saying that's why you would do it. I'm not saying you're, you're doing it to cause the issue for the employee. But we all know that what happens and what is perceived to happen are two different things. So the only thing I wanted to say was in your pre-screening, uh, I would suggest that you go with a post-offer pre-screen now. And I had talked about that before, if you don't understand what that means. Basically, you're going to offer this contingent upon background check and so on. So you've made the decision to hire. Then you're going to do a screening. And in that screening, you have a confidential inquiry of the person and it's not the hiring authority that does it unless you're too small to be able to do it in a two-step process but you just have to be careful because whoever's making the hiring here is going to have information about this person's drug use and it's going to be medically prescribed and you want to make darn sure that you're not going to be accused of making a decision based upon that protected classification that's it okay. sorry no perfect thank you that's exactly what i was looking for um, all right, you can move to the next slide, Chase. So, and of course, if, especially if you are required through some kind of federal guidelines or programs to um, have a, a drug testing policy, don't reinvent the wheel. There are tons and tons of templates on normally the um, regulating 
group's website that you can pull or sometimes different um, like SHRM or the Kentucky League of Cities and those types of places will often have templates for you to utilize. So don't feel like you've got to try to create something that's federally compliant from scratch that already exists. But um, regardless, you want to ensure that you have some kind of drug related workplace policy in place before you start doing any of the screenings or redoing your screening policy because you want to be able to point to um, something that they are violating. So for example, if you have a, a policy that says, and to Jim's point, make sure it is not a zero tolerance policy, but if you have a policy that says employees are not allowed to operate machinery while under the influence of any prohibited substances while at work or employees are not able to perform their job duties under prohibited substances, then if you do later do a pre-employment or a reasonable suspicion screening that they do not pass, you're at least pointing to a policy that they're violating. Um, so, all right, we can move to the next slide. And so when you're creating your policies, um, and we're kind of focusing on the the post-offer um, pre-assignment policy at this point. When you're thinking about the guidelines, so number one is who is covered. So of course, are your full-time employees covered? Are you looking at any contractors or contractors who might work with certain projects or clients? Is it only those who drive vehicles? Is it only those who operate this type of machinery or only those who work in your laboratory? So make sure you're very, very clear about who is covered by these pre-employment, um, or sorry, pre post offer pre placement screenings um, so that then you can be consistent and it's much easier for the manager or for you to communicate to employees um, both before the test is administered and after. And then the timing. So um, within 48 hours of position acceptance is always a good rule. We've seen people do it over much longer time periods, but depending on what you are testing for, of course, that could give substances time to get out of someone's system. Um, if you're doing a hair test, timing does not matter nearly as much because that will look a lot farther back, but for a standard urine test, 48 hours um, is a, a good rule of thumb. And Jim's got something to say here. I am uh, leaning toward not using hair tests as much because the law has changed and basically said that what you have to show for reasonable cause testing, especially, or anything incident related, or anything that relates to on the job activities that you believe are illegal, um, hair test goes back for marijuana like six months. So the problem is if you're doing a hair follicle test and you're making decisions about on the job activities, you can't tie that to on the job because of the length of time and how the um, drugs will show up. So I would be very careful about which test you're using for which purposes. If you're doing a pre-screen, you can do a hair follicle test because if you wanna find out if anybody's used cocaine in the last six months or whatever, that I, I haven't researched how long it stays in for cocaine. If you wanna do that, it's up to you. But if you're doing a reasonable cause notification, like somebody just had a car wreck and you're going to do a drug test on them because of that, or workers comp related, I would avoid the, um, the more permanent uh, drug testing because you're probably going to get hit with a, you can't prove it was while I was driving the forklift. That could have been six months ago. So be careful which one you use and apply that technology to the incident or to the situation in front of you. If it's reasonable cause, go with the more instant. Right now, what's in your, what's in your system this minute? Mm -hmm. That's what we're concerned about. If you're hiring, yeah, we're concerned with your whole history. We wanna make sure you're a good apple. So we're gonna look at everything. Just make sure you tie it to the right type of um, procedure so that you're not doing the wrong test that pulls too much information that can be used against you as an employer. Absolutely. That's a great point. And yeah, in general, we recommend that employers not use hair testing unless it's a very sensitive environment, sometimes in medical environments and that type of thing. But in general, yeah, you don't need the information from six months ago um, or even longer for the hair test. You really just need to know what's in their system now. Um, so in addition to that, where to test, um, as Jim had said in his slides, and as we always recommend people, do not do on-site testing unless you are a medical laboratory, but even then it's better to have a, a third party that is um, not influenced by you. 
Um, don't you, because it's harder to defend those in court if something were to happen. Um, we've seen people use their little kits that you can buy and they keep on site for emergencies. But even then, we recommend going ahead and using a third party, sending them out, getting those results verified by a third party. Um, and this is where type of test comes into play as well. So a lot of employers that we walk into, they end up doing like a 10 panel test. And when we ask why, the question seems to be shocking to them because it's like, well, that's just what we were given by the um, the group that we use, or that's what it's always been tested for. 10 panel tests sometimes cover things like Russian quaaludes and like different drugs that don't even exist anymore. So um, definitely look at what you are actually testing for and make sure it's what you are intending to test for, because number one, you'll save money if you reduce your test, and number two, you'll reduce the amount of information that you get about this person that is not necessary. Um, and then what to test, oh, I'm sorry, I switched those, what to test for. So type of tests, like Jen said, the, the three most common are hair, urine, and urine observed. We recommend urine um, for the majority of our clients. And then urine observed is what we recommend if something comes back inconclusive and you haven't already set a policy to not allow them to retest. Um, like if you're willing to allow that, we'd ask you to have them do urine observed. Or um, sometimes for reasonable suspicion, we'll go ahead and do urine observed as the first test. But again, hair is not normally recommended unless you've got a very sensitive workplace. Um, and then what if they refuse? So you definitely want to have documented how to handle the different situations if someone is going to refuse to test. Normally, for the pre or the post hire pre placement, it's just you're not hired. You're not going to be placed. Thank you so much for your time. But if they get a negative result um, and they are hired, or they get a I'm sorry, if they get a negative result, um, they're able to be hired. If they get a positive or an inconclusive, the real question is how do you handle those? So some people, if they get a positive, will refuse to hire. Um, now I know what Jim would say here. First, of course, if you get a positive for a substance, you will ask the employee if it is medically prescribed. And if they are able to provide you with um, the proof that it is a medically prescribed substance, at that point you can reevaluate. And normally the, the way to move forward is to go ahead and hire them um, unless it is job related and is going to interfere with their um, regular duties. But if it's um, inconclusive, do you want to um, allow them to retest observed or do you want to not hire them at all? So again, that's up to you. We get a lot of inconclusives. A lot of times though, it is people trying to thwart the test, drinking too much water in advance. And so the, the um, sample is the wrong temperature or trying to sneak in other urine um, and the system catches that again it's the wrong temperature or there's something weird about it um, that it has some something related to women when it's a man taking the test so inconclusive results are, are sometimes indicative of someone taking it incorrectly sometimes indicative of them trying to thwart it and then how you receive and store the results so also to Jim's point you want to be very careful who these test results come to because again those people are going to have very sensitive information about the um, tester and they're going to be able to make some decisions with that. We've been into clients where the hiring manager was sent the information directly from the um, testing site with no, no HR guidance. And we really don't recommend that because sometimes managers do not know how to handle sensitive information like that. So we recommend when possible to have all results sent to an HR person who can then help disseminate information if necessary. The hope is even if they get a positive and they um, are, you know, even if they get a positive, we are able to reach out. We are able to get the information from them about the medical prescription. We are able to look at the job duties, decide that it's not going to interfere, and you can go ahead and hire that person and never have any knowledge of their medical condition. So that's how ideally it would go. And then, of course, all results should go in a confidential personnel file. All right, we'll go to the next slide. So setting up the screening. Um, I'm going to keep this part really short because I know most people already have screenings in place, but of course, making sure that you are looking at what type of test you're offering and that it's what you intend to be giving and um, what you're testing for. Same thing. Um, a lot of local companies, and we love to do this with local companies who hire locally, have a direct relationship with an occupational health location here in town. You can set up an account. They bill you directly. You just give the employee a piece of paper that they sign, they take with them, and um, you're billed and you get the results. However, for a lot of larger organizations or people who hire not locally, you want them to be able to screen wherever they live before they 
come to you. Um, so there's a lot of nationwide networks like Quest and LabCorp. Um, you can normally set up an account for free and they just bill you per screening. Or a lot of the payroll and HRIS systems are moving towards embedding those kinds of services and they will normally work with a national network as well. So again, Quest, LabCorp, really great options if you're hiring people from outside of your little bubble. Um, all right, we can move on to the next one. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about reasonable suspicion policies. So a reasonable suspicion policy is, of course, for cause. Um, that means that it has to be individual to the person. It has to be based on objective facts. And the best way to think about it is, like, would a reasonable person have reason to believe that this employee is on a prohibited, subs prohibited substance? So if you move to the next one, um, we've got a list of some of the, um, you, yeah, some of the, some of the items that you can think about when you're deciding if it counts um, as an objective observance. So direct observation could be slurred speech. Are they agitated or very lethargic? Are they moving in a really uncoordinated kind of jerky way? Are they responding to all of your questions inappropriately? Um, do they have erratic behavior at work? Are they hearing voices? Are they acting markedly different from their normal behavior? Is their work performance seriously deteriorating? And this is one that you have to be very careful on because you cannot just blame someone's poor work performance on um, drugs by default. If they have a lot of these other instances going on, it could be used in your favor to help support um, getting the reasonable suspicion test, but it on its own is not a good reason to do a reasonable suspicion test. And then, of course, if someone reports to you that they have observed someone using a substance and you investigate and you have reason to believe that person and it looks like a credible report. And Jim's got some more valuable well first, well, first of all, you kind of described me, so I'm a little bit worried now about <laughs> reasonable cause tested. But no, the, the thing I was going to point out is documentation of each one of these is critical. You can't just write a letter or a notice, RCT, without ever having any documentation of these activities, unless you're literally witnessing it at that time and you're doing documentation at that time. So if you're talking about a you know, deterioration in work performance, abnormal conduct, you need to have documented examples. And the other thing that is critical here, and I've, I've got one right now I'm dealing with, your reasonable cause testing better follow to a T the facts upon which you rely. Because if you make up something that is not there, or you even accidentally, which is what this was, oh, we didn't mean to do that. We thought it said this. Well, if your reasonable cause testing says, we found you with this, and then you come back, oh, no, we didn't find you with that. We thought you had that, but it was just something else. That will kill any ability you have to enforce an RCT test. So document and make darn sure you look at your policy, and the facts, have your facts match what actually occurred and make sure they dovetail into what the policy is. Don't try to pigeonhole it in. If you don't have it fit in there, don't do it. If it doesn't fit, don't drug test. Awesome. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, okay, move on. We can move on to the next slide. Um, so for the reasonable suspicion policy, you want to kind of think through um, the same types of things, who can be reasonably, who can be tested based on your reasonable suspicion policy, only employers, contractors, um, only people who do X, Y, Z job. Timing, and this is very important for the reasonable suspicion. As Jim said, you want to do it immediately. You want to find out what is in their system as soon as possible. However, we have had some clients who have had issues um, have let things go on longer than they should because perhaps they're a 24-hour location and they never found out that someone was acting oddly until the next morning and in the moment they couldn't get them into a drug testing center. Again, just as soon as possible, even if it's in the middle of a night shift, go ahead and let the employee know they need to go as, as immediately after their shift is over as soon as the location opens where the drug testing is available. Um, and do not, as Jim said, feel like um, doing it on site is going to be the safest option. We've had people buy tests and try to administer it themselves because of this uh, kind of issue with the timing. And again, it's it's hard to enforce. So 
try to just get them into your third party location as soon as that location is open. So within eight hours, if alcohol is suspected is the normal rule of thumb and within 32 hours of drug use is suspected, but again, ASAP is going to be most um, helpful. And then where test, again, third parties are better. Use your regular tester if at all possible. Um, what type are you just testing for um, the normal panel? Um, and then what test for, sorry, I keep switching those, the urine test. Um, again, we recommend urine or urine observed for reasonable suspicion every time. Do not do hair. Um, urine observed is going to ensure that, you know, the employee, if, if they are given additional time, so if you find out at midnight that you think that they are on drugs at work and they can't go to the drug test until 8 a.m., urine observed is going to be very helpful because it's going to make sure that they don't, um, during that time period, try to thwart the test. But whatever you choose, make sure that it's consistent for all similarly situated employees for your reasonable suspicion policy. And then if they refuse, assume that you're going to terminate them. Um, and how handle a, neg a positive result. So if they do get a positive, are they immediately terminated? Are they allowed to have a chance to you know, go to rehab or to do different EAP processes? And then how are you gonna receive and store the results? So one thing to note um, when you are talking about how to handle a positive reasonable suspicion is there are several states who have very unique guidelines about this. You are not able to immediately terminate someone for using a, an illegal drug for their very first offense under reasonable suspicion. I can't remember the state, but so make sure that you're looking at your state laws when you're determining how you want to handle these positive reasonable suspicion tests. Um, but in general, you have a lot of leeway. And in general, most companies end up um, terminating or um, allowing them to, sorry, requiring them to go to rehab or some type of counseling. Um, and then other ways, of course, that you can also um, do discipline related to these would be an EA, you know, sending them to the EAP, retesting after six months, um, that type of thing as well. So there's, again, potentially some leeway, but make sure you're following state guidelines. And then, of course, if you're a federally regulated site, like we already talked about, you're pretty stuck in what you can do. So, all right, you can move to the next one. Okay, I think we've wrapped up. All right, questions. questions. Um, there is a good question in the chat that I was, was going to say, yeah, Jim, you've been answering some of them kind of in the chat as they've come in, but um, yeah. uh, last, maybe... one I, last one I was going to do, but I knew we were close and I, I needed to explain it a little bit. Uh -huh. There's going to be, there's going to be some, so if anybody does, wants to know what it was, it says we have forklift drivers, crane operators, technicians, uh, we must test for marijuana. Does this mean that we will no longer be able to test for THC at the specified positions beginning in 2025? How will the tolerance levels be established for the approved ADA criteria? Also, what if we hire someone and then they hurt somebody and they were using the medically prescribed THC? So there's only so much I can go through in a webinar like this. So I didn't include the, yeah, but be careful about this and don't worry about that because I can't cover everything. Uh, and we're going to have to get into to meeting with some of you, as I have in the past, individually about your specific issues and how we can draft policies, how we can, we can shape this for you individually. I can't answer individual legal questions. We all know that. So let me start with this. First of all, this statute is most definitely not going to um, have anything to do with anything that's federally controlled. It's illegal under federal law. So commercial driver's licenses, heavy equipment operators, if you have to have a, a proper CDL for any of that, that, that's federal. If you're under a federal control, you're gonna have to govern under federal and you're not gonna be allowed to use drugs in those positions. If you're engaged in an activity on a federal work site, you can't use drugs on that. The other thing is this, every job, every single job in the entire world has what's called essential functions of the job. If you as an employer can make a determination that someone cannot safely do a job, whether they have a disability or not, they can't do that job. Now, I'll give you a prime example. I had a situation in a manufacturing facility in uh, Southeast United States where someone wanted to be what we call a driver. 
What they do is at the end of the automotive manufacturing facility, person hops in the car, drives it out, parks it in red lot number 24 behind blue car number whatever. They then get on a bus and they come back and they get the next car and they drive it out to blue lot, wherever they're supposed to do. The individual could not read. They sued us. We won. Why? Because the person had dyslexia, could not read, and we could not have for health, safety, and welfare, a person driving a vehicle, operating a machine off the end of a line, having to drive through crowded parking lots, driving to an area where they couldn't see what the, the letters and words were. And so we had a legitimate business reason to not have someone who could not read and understand caution signs and common language issues. So it does not matter that there's a law in place that says people with a disability can use marijuana because people with a disability can use, I'm sorry, people with a medical condition can use OxyContin too. You don't have to allow that person to drive and operate a machine, a vehicle, or work on a manufacturing floor as long as you've properly built an essential, e essential functions questionnaire that's legitimate for the position that you're trying to hire for. For example, on that, deal with a lot of manufacturing facilities, a lot of automotive. You can have a lot of people who are in one area of the factory that don't have to lift, bend, and twist they just have to be able to carry 50 pounds. Unless you rotate people in every single position and they're plug and play. If they're plug and play, then you can do an FCE, functional capacity evaluation, for every single position for which this person is gonna be doing a job. If possibly being under the influence of marijuana will impair someone's ability to reasonably do their job, they can't do that job. All you have to do is make darn sure that your FCE Functional capacity evaluation properly screens. Don't ask the question whether they can lift, bend, and twist if they're not going to lift, bend, and twist. Don't ask the question about 50 pounds if the max that you expect is 15. You have to have a policy in place ahead of time to screen these people out that is a legitimate business policy. If they're high, will they cause injury to other people? You can't have truck drivers that are using medical marijuana. You can't have bus drivers using medical marijuana. You can't have crane operators using medical marijuana. These are the things that one, the regulations are gonna to have to address. And two, your policies are gonna spell out. If you are a heavy equipment operator, crane, forklift, other areas where you could kill somebody by doing something wrong, then you cannot do the essential functions of the job while you are on medically prescribed or non-medically prescribed medications. So the answer is you're still gonna screen. And the answer is you're still gonna preclude, but you're gonna to have to document that the reason is not because they tested positive. The reason is because they're using medically prescribed, which is not a problem, but then they're doing a, a job where they literally could kill someone if they don't know what they're doing or if they happen to be slow reacting and have the uh, functional capacities diminished by using medical marijuana or oxycodone or Tylenol, if that causes you to be, basically what you can do as an employer is anything the person is taking that could impair their capability to do the essential functions of their job makes it so they're not qualified to do the job either temporarily while they're on the medical marijuana or permanently. Then we're gonna have to get into, and this is, truly legal, uh, I mean, legal guidance. What do you do if somebody is already employed as a crane operator and now is going to have to be chronically on pain medication, marijuana pain medication? You're going to have to find, or you, you may have to find a reasonable accommodation for that person. Is there a non-mechanical job that that person can do, a desk job or other that that person could be transitioned into because now they're allowed to take the medical marijuana and it is, uh, it's a situation where you can't discriminate. So do you need to find a different job for them? Again, those are issues that would be 
individual to each one of you that I'd have to sit down and, and walk through, okay, what's this person? What's their job? What are the essential functions? What are their opportunities? How many employees? A whole lot of different questions. But basically think about it this way. Commercial drivers, people involved in safety, fire, police, uh, ambulance, medical field, child-related, um, uh, transportation-related, those are probably not going to allow a tremendous amount of drug use because it's okay that you have an issue and it's okay that you're medically prescribed, but it ain't okay to start driving a bus with 30 kids in it while you're high. So you have to kind of look at this from that perspective and the law will catch up with it. Um, the other thing is I want to talk about the policy for just a second. I had one comment on the last thing that Allison said, which was anytime that you're talking about someone being drug tested for reasonable cause testing and trying to get them in and waiting until eight o'clock when the drug facility opens, drug testing facility opens. Be very careful about false imprisonment. Be very careful about spelling out in your policy itself that they, uh, they consent that if there's reasonable cause, reasonable suspicion that they know ahead of time, not at the time of the drug test, not at the time you're trying to lock them down, they understand when they get employed or when they sign the new policy, they will be bound by being sequestered until such time as they go in for a drug test so that you don't get sued for a false imprisonment. They agreed beforehand that they would be locked down and, and be in that situation. So those are, I don't know what new questions are down there, but there you go. Um, uh, they're more, so, they're yeah, they're, yeah, they're basically about accommodation, making sure that the jobs are equal to uh, the, the job that they would have been in previous to. Disclosure. Yeah, so that gets into um, individual legal yeah. That, that's too far down the rabbit hole. Um, to go. Sorry. Yeah, uh, but piggybacking off that, Jim, I think there's, it was a question earlier on the chat, but you kind of addressed it, but just to reiterate. Um, so basically you're saying though that people could make different designations or um, determinants based on the job that the person's performance. In the same company, you could have different screening requirements based on the essential functions of said job. Yeah, you should have that right now anyway, because... Okay. Uh, Doing a reasonable cause uh, testing of a, I'm just going to use a secretary or a, a, a personal assistant, is different than somebody who is a chauffeur or someone who is engaging in um, uh, protection of other people's children, for example. So of employees would be determining what you're doing for trusting anyway. And that may be where some people fall on this. You know what? I'm not going to worry about rank and file, secretarial, administrative assistant, personal assistant. We're not going to drug test those anymore because getting into personal questions about disabilities is not going to work for us. But if you're ever going to drive a vehicle for us or go out um, into the public or with a public facing job, then we have to have a drug test. And then, of course, if you're chauffeuring people around, if you're driving a bus, if you're operating a, a heavy machine, if you're up on the roof, then we're going to require it because of the health, safety, and welfare of you and the people around you. I can I I prefer different policies for different types of positions because you should always be focused on the legitimate business re reason for doing it. Now, obviously, pre-employment, again, I would suggest pre-employment be a post-offer pre higher decision. That way, you've already made the decision that you're going to hire the person based upon their qualifications. Then if they tell you, I'm going to test positive for marijuana because I have a medical prescription, then you can hire that person or not hire that person based upon other drugs but you can't get sued because you've already offered that person the job as long as all they have is the medical pres medically prescribed marijuana. That's why I suggest you do all the interview, you make your decision, and you literally give them an offer contingent upon passing the drug test. Then you ask them the questions. You're in less harm there because now you've offered them the job. As an employer, you get to ask disability-related questions if it relates to potential issues with medical. This doesn't apply, obviously, if they're operating heavy machinery, 
uh, even if they disclose it to you, if they're going to test positive with heavy machinery, you've got a different issue because of the health, safety, and welfare. Great. Um, I think you pretty much have answered all the questions that you can answer. Um, but my takeaway from what you just said, Jim, is it all goes back to making sure you have a great job description for that every position, that it is detailed and it is up to date. Yes, you need to have a job description that covers the job or jobs that the person is doing. Don't just make one up that's not going to have any, any relevancy. Number two, make sure your policies are established before you have an issue, not during a crisis. Because if you try to follow a drug testing policy while you're in the middle of it, you don't have any controls set out, you're going to get sued and it, it, you're going to mess it up. You have to have the employee understood that this is the policy, the employee breached the policy, and then you drug tested based on that policy. Have it all spelled out beforehand. Look at your policies and procedures. Make darn sure you don't have a zero tolerance. You've got to address the new law. Okay. And give me a call if you have questions. I was going to say, nice way to, sum up, to summarize everything and kind of tie everything in a bow. So um, thank you all very much for attending today's session. Uh, thanks, Jim and uh, Allison, for your contributions, and your expertise, and all the other wonderful.